Welcome to this podcast is making me thirsty. The number one destination for Seinfeld fans. This episode 122. Today's guest is a film and television actress. You know her from Guiding Light, Charmed, Red Dragon, True Blood. And of course, she played Allison, the Drakeette in two Seinfeld episodes, The Handicapped, Spot, and The Pilot. Please welcome Elizabeth Dennehy. Elizabeth, thanks for joining. Of course. Thank you so much. All right, Elizabeth. So take us back. If you could believe it or not, it was 29 years ago. All right. May 13th, <laughs> the handicap handicap spot aired. Um, you obviously had the iconic role of the Drake get. We all know about the Drake and the Drake get, but tell us a little bit about how the role um, came about. Was there an audition pro- process? What do you remember from uh, 1993? I remember it was an audition. And I don't know about you guys, but when I audition for comedies, I get really stressed out. It's like, because you have to be funny. You have to be funny in a comedy. That's kind of a rule. So I remember being like, oh, God, you know, there's so much pressure. But the beautiful thing about that part is the more intensely psychotically serious she is, the funnier she is. So it wasn't like I had to be a comedian with a setup and a punchline, boom, you know, like that kind of humor. Um, And uh, I remember being given direction. I can't remember who directed it. Can't remember. Uh, Tom Tom Sharonis. Yeah, Tom Sharonis probably. Um, And, you know, they gave me some direction and it was, yeah, it was fun. I can't remember. God, I I wish I could remember more. But um, I don't think I went into the audition with Rick Overton. I think I met him on the set, the, the Drake. Um, but I will, I will remember one thing I've done. I had done up until that point, a lot of final episodes of shows I had done. Like I was in the last episode of Brooklyn bridge after they already found out they were canceled. And, And this has happened to me a number of times where you're in a dying show, you're cast in a dying show and they're just like, Oh, so do you want me to stand over here? Whatever, whatever, you know, they're, they're depressed. They're over it. This show had been on for three or four years. It back in the day when a show could actually find its legs, where it wasn't canceled after one. Seinfeld would have been canceled now, after one season. Like yeah. that's the way things are now. If it doesn't break out and you're not a big, big blockbuster right away, you get canceled nowadays. That show was still, I can't remember what season it was, but it had been chugging along, chugging along, kind of a culty show. And the, the when we taped our show, it had just that week broken the top 10. So they were ecstatic. They were floating on clouds. They were really, really happy. And I remember very distinctly like, oh, this feels so different. This is very, very different. They're happy. They're clapping each other on the back. They're laughing. Everybody was elated that they were going to, they were hit. They were finally a hit. Yeah, it was season four and you were, you were on right towards the end of season four. Like you said, it was just kind of breaking out. Um, the contest had aired earlier that junior made some of these bigger episodes had aired earlier. Um, back in the day when there were fewer networks. So, um, it was, you know, I mean, I was a kid, there were only four networks, but th- there there was cable at this point, but it was still was like, oh yeah, that over there, you know, wasn't, wasn't competitive. So to break into the top 10 and be on the show, it was, it was a thrill to be there when they were all really happy and, uh, you know, feeling very confident and jubilant and enthusiastic. It was a great feeling. So were you were you a fan of the show? Like we said, this was season four. It was certainly taken off. You mentioned it was kind of culty. Um, obviously, it was on one night's episode. You know, finally got the Thursday night kind of love it deserved from an audience perspective. But were you a fan of the show? Like when you auditioned, did you have a, a sense of who these characters were? Yeah, I loved the show. I thought they were hysterical. I thought that they, um, they made, I think it was... I can't remember any show before Seinfeld where you fell in love with such unlikable people. I mean, they were so, they were not likable. They were just self-centered and they, they, they walked that fine line of being self-centered and dislikable and also being really hugely identifiable. Like everybody could identify with George and I, all the women could identify with Elaine. Yeah. They were very, um, 
identifiable, recognizable characters. And uh, that was a, a razor's edge that they walked really deftly, I thought. So it was, it was definitely um, uh, a hit and we, we loved it. We loved the show. Yeah, and, and to that point, I mean, the George character obviously is very much based on Larry David. It's, you know, pretty well known at that point, especially in season four when Larry David and he wrote that episode, The Handicap Spot. Um, curious, any any interaction with him on set or, or even, you know, audition process just on set, like during the table reads or, or during the, the shooting when you worked with Larry David at all? Or Yeah, he was intimidating as hell. He was really, um, you know, uh, totally in charge. All the actors were laughing and joking. And um, Rick Overton is a hilarious comedian. So everybody, it was just like one big party. But I'll remember um, one specific thing was after we filmed the pilot, and I believe we we taped the show, and I believe my mom was in the audience. It was, um, so that was really exciting. And then after we taped the show, the audience was still there. He had me record a voice message. There's a, where I leave a, a message on the phone. Yes. And I'll never forget, you know, he had to make everybody be really quiet. So they're recording this. I can't remember what I had to say, but I remember I did it. And then he said, yeah, that's not funny. Try this. And And, you know, now I look back and it wasn't that I wasn't funny. It was the like the there was a way to say what I was saying funnier. There the line could have been funnier. But at the time I felt disemboweled. I was like, oh, I'm not funny. Like, again, that pressure of trying to be funny. Um, But I felt like, oh, so now, you know, the pressure is on. Like, imagine Larry David saying to you, yeah, that's not funny. Um, And then coming coming up with a different way to say it. (laughs) Yeah, sir. Certainly, uh, an in- intimidating presence. So another issue that so that episode, um, the handicaps on when it first aired, was the first introduction of the Costanzas. But if you remember, I know you remember this. John Randolph played George Costanza's father on the original episode. What do you? And then obviously, we all know Jerry Stiller kind of took over the role. But what do you remember about John Randolph and kind of just? the whole vibe on the set with the Costanzas. Were you there for that or was, or did you shoot, you shot? You only, shoot, you only shoot your scenes. We had no interaction. We, you know, I wasn't there when they were there. Interesting. Mm-hmm. So, so back to the Drake of the Drake. Yeah. It, it's just, it's such a funny concept. I'm just curious how that got introduced to you. Like when you first read the script, were you like, what is this? Like, how, I know Larry David wrote this. Was there an explanation on what the Drake and Drake was all about? Um, no, not really. I'm just trying to think if there, you remember, this is a long time ago and I'm old, <laughs> yeah. very old. No, it's just this, this is the story. And the basic, basically what you you have to do as an actor is the play the characters given circumstances that she's, she's getting married to this guy and growing disenchanted with the whole notion. So you had to plant the seeds of this isn't going well. This is this is probably not going to be a good thing, not going well. And um, so Rick was playing, you know, distraught. And I was just like, oh, you know, just over the whole thing and going through the motions of the the engagement and the shower and all of that, um, you know, just so that it's believable and heightening the stakes for the actors, the, the, the main characters to get this gift back to somehow. Yeah. Um, save themselves some money by being we're so despondent we're so wrapped up in our we are actually two people who were actually more self-centered than them <laughs> we're going true. through a crisis right? right right that's true yeah you basically yeah you become more important and more self-centered than them which doesn't happen very often in the show so that's interesting right um, so in order for that to work it's not like we were actively hostily preventing them from getting the gift back but just had other things to think about rather than, you know, their money and their wallets. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. It's funny too. Cause they, they, you mentioned is it kind of the end of season four, right? That episode handicap spot. And then the final episode of season four, the pilot, um, they bring you back right for that, for that scene. Um, hate the sign. Um, how did that work? I mean, we, we always, we love that episode cause they do, they do bring back all the guest stars and, and let them all kind of ha- have, have another moment. Um, how did that shooting work? Were you able to kind of be on set for that whole week where you got to see everyone coming back or 
You literally come in and you do your thing. Yeah. So how, how did they bring you back? Did they did they tell you during the handicap spot you might come back or was it sort no, of like no, a surprise? No, or? I think they probably went by through all the guests that have come in and who's available. I'm sure that's how that that, that happened. And yeah, I, was I, think delighted, it, I was delighted to be remembered. Yeah, yeah. I think availability, but also I think it was it was, you know, worked with the story, right? Like, let's get people back whom, like you mentioned, um, kind of wronged them or they didn't get along with that sort of thing. Because most of the people in that pilot that were watching it were those those recurring characters who kind of, you know, were rememberable to the audience of for that reason, right? Um, so it's great that anybody did back. I think it, yeah, it's it's really really cool. I think, uh, I think the comedy is what we're saying is that these people are out for themselves, right? How can I work the system and get ahead? And then they, so it's almost like a victim contest. Then they meet people who are actually going through trauma and crises that are, you know, greater than theirs. And, um, you know, it, it pulls them back up like, oh yeah, there are other people in the world. And some people really have, really have problems. Yeah. Um, and, and so your first your first scene is is with Jerry and Elaine, right? Or, or you know Jerry and Julia, and then you also have one with Jason and and Michael at the end when they come pick up the, uh, the TV. Um, what can you tell us about kind of working with them for as far as acting goes? The actors, um, you know, on set, we've heard they're very welcoming, and 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 you know some of the guest stars have had stories with each of them, uh, you know, throughout the week and things like that. Um, you know, if you, yeah. if you have any any. I wish I could think of some. Um you know, funny stories, anecdotes. I just remember a lot of, lot of laughing. Um, you know, Jerry's a comedian, Rick Overton's a comedian. Um, I think one of the most surprising things is how different Jason Alexander is from George. Like he is such a generous, kind, compassionate, um, and, and I, you know, he's just a wonderful, wonderful guy. And the other thing is, is that usually comedians are um, quiet, like in normal life, they're not always on. But this, I, this was a very on set. They were very on, and I think it was because they were so happy about having a hit show that their show was finally being recognized. You know, so I just, yeah. I just remember a lot of laughing, a lot of uh, laughs, and uh, hilarity. For sure. And, you know, speaking of laughter, we'd be remiss if we didn't mention uh, your father. I mean, boy, he made us laugh. It's funny. Two years later, after your scene, we one of our one of our favorite movies of all time was Tommy Boy. Um, did, did you get I mean, I, I I'm imagine you learned so much from your father and that, kind of that that comedic sense, if you will. Um, I'm sure he was proud of your your Seinfeld appearance as well. Yeah, he was he was very, very proud. And I'm also so glad that before he passed away, he got to see my own son. My son is um, doing uh, great, great things. My son went to the DePaul Theater School in Chicago. And since he graduated, he's working a ton. Um, and the thing with my father is what he always said was serve the writer, serve the playwright, serve the material. It's not about you. Get out of the way. Um, and I, I am an acting teacher, and the thing I always say is you got to play the characters given circumstances, not the actors given circumstances. So, for instance, if the actor is thinking, I need to get a laugh, and they're asking for a laugh, it's the sure fire way to not get a laugh. You've got to, for these characters, this is very, very, very serious. And like I said, the more intensely serious this crisis is, the funnier it is. That's so, yeah, my dad was all about all about um, it's not about you. It's about the material and uh, stepping out of the way. That's great insight and, and always great to hear that you're passing that knowledge on. Um, and, and yeah, and what better show to, to talk about that than, than Seinfeld, right? The material of the pages. I mean, Larry David wrote wrote this episode. I mean, there's not not going to find much more. Uh, you know, a much, a much better script to serve than that. Right. And that's, what's so great about, about the show. We talked to so many guest stars, you know, we, we talked to a guest star last week, who had literally one line, right. But it's still shined. It's still remembered because the materials there and, yeah. and it just serves so well to everyone who's watching. Um, have but you yeah, talked, I, have you talked to Rick? Have you gotten Rick? Over no, to but it's great. I know you've mentioned him a couple of times and I, I believe we have reached out to him, but um, we'd love to have him on. Yeah. I mean, he's definitely uh, very memorable. As oh, you I should have asked you that. I could have bugged him and gone on, on here with him. We love the Drake. Yeah. Yeah. We love the Drake. <laughs> <laughs> Gotta love Drake. 
Yeah. Well, I, I, would, I, I would love to know what that wedding would have been like if they had gone through with it. I, well, it's funny. The, the storyline lived on, even though you weren't on there, right? They talked about the wedding during the Super Bowl and the Drake. Hill. I mean, it's just yeah, and in another episode, the label maker, they bring they bring up the Drake again. It just and in, in, in talking about were you ever were you ever asked to, to come back or was that ever? I know because they mentioned the Drake, obviously, in, in, in later years. I'm just curious if. Um, oh, I wish I wish. Yeah. Were there Elizabeth, were there any I know, like, you know, there's a lot to film. Were there any scenes that you remember that maybe didn't make the cut? Um you know, anything between you and, and Overton that might have not made the cut, but you you recall happening? I know it was only 29 years ago, but uh, I mean, this is like when, you know, I did Star Trek The Next Generation. I was yeah. 28, 28 when I did that show and I'm 61 now. And people will say to me, what was your phaser frequency set up when you're on the Borg ship? And it's like, <laughs> <laughs> I don't. I wish to God I did. I could help you. I should have watched the show before I, I joined you guys. But um, I just remember that Rick, who is a comedian, could riff on like improv lines. And um, I also came from that world. Of, uh, I was one of the original creators of Tony and Tina's Wedding. And so we did a lot of stuff um, before. You know, it's a great way to start a scene is to. Yeah improvise some lines, but I can't give you an example of exactly what we said from, from something 30 years ago. Right. Um, but we did improvise a lot to get ourselves go going in the scene. Um, and that was the way they worked as well. Um, like I, I couldn't even remember the director's name. So there you go. I mean, I'm just, I'm the worst guest you've ever had on your podcast. No, that is not well, true at all. <laughs> well, here's, I mean, most of your work up until then, I believe was more like, um, you know, dramas and things of that nature. But Obviously, being at Seinfeld, number one, you know, comedy on television. I know you mentioned you were a little, you were a little nervous for the um, audition, um, but obviously you nailed it. I mean, could you tell us a little bit more about like what you knew, what they told you about the character and kind of how you prepared for that? So the way it works is you get an, uh, um, an audition, you get sides and you show up at the appointment and there's 30 people waiting and they, so there's no conversation. If you can't figure out, you have to do detective work. If you can't figure out what's going on, you're probably not going to get the part. You kind of have to fill in the blanks, but nobody sits around with each actor. I mean, unless you're, I guess, a name and, and explains what's going on. You go in, sometimes you have the whole script, but usually you just have the sides. And if you're some, if you're confused about something, you can go in and they'll say, do you have any questions? And you can ask, why am I doing this? What, what's going on here? But they don't want to take the time. They want, you're in and out of there. It's next, next, next. So, um, you know, I don't know if they had Rick in mind. I don't know if the Drake was already cast. I really don't. I just showed up and I was lucky to get, I think, I think I might've had a call back. Um, maybe that was with Rick. I don't know. I'm so <laughs> ill-prepared. do my homework. I'm so ill-prepared. But we, um, all I know is that um, I had the instinct to be really deadly humorless and really serious and the more irritated and the more irate and the more miserable and over my fiance I was, was going to make it funnier. So um, I don't know if anybody else had that instinct, but you know, I'm glad that they, they saw something they needed in me. Yeah. And it worked per, I mean, you, you nailed it for sure. And I think that's a testament to, to the whole production over there, you know, Larry, Jerry, uh, Mark Hirschfeld, and obviously yourself that, you know, they, they just always pick the right person for the role and just, you know, nailing it perfectly. Um, you know, and it's, 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 um, it's fun for us to talk to all these guest stars because, um, you know, it, it sounds like from what we're gathering from everyone that, that the, the, the set is so welcoming and so inviting that um, it, it's easy to, to do your job, right? It's easy for you to come in and just nail it like you did, um, yeah. you know, and I, yeah. I think one of the things that um, it's, if actors are listening is I was doing um, a TV series. It was a pilot that got picked up. No, it was a pilot. We were shooting a pilot. Didn't get picked up. 
with Rosanna Arquette called Daisy and Chess. And the director, Bob Berlinger, gave me a huge piece of advice. So it wasn't about this job. He said, um, when we were shooting, he was like, you don't have to keep auditioning. You've, aud you've gotten the part. And I think you got to just relax. They saw something in you. They want you to be this character. You, now you just have to be the Drakeette. Instead of proving every single minute you're on the set that you deserve the part and feeling like you need to show them they made the right choice, you need to then at that point relax into it. And that's why Rick and I just like, you know, we're improvising, kicking around ideas, saying lines um, leading up to before. I don't know. I couldn't tell you how much of that ended up in it, um, how much was changed from the original script. I wish I knew, but. Um, I'm old, like I said, and thank, thankfully I've had enough jobs since then. And before then that, you know, it, nothing really stands out to me except for that answering machine call where he was like, that's not funny. And I was like, don't take it personally. <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, I remember I wore my own clothes. I remember my hair was really dark then. I don't know why I had my hair dark. My hair was like a light brown back then, and I wore it straight in the show. Um, you know, I wore, and I wore my own clothes, which was kind of fun. Yeah, we have yeah, a couple of times where the yeah they the, were really really fun. They were really sweet and welcoming, and just filled with joy. And what a difference it was to be on a joy filled set rather than one like already canceled. We just have to fill up, finish up. <laughs> now, Elizabeth, what you know. I just watched the show, obviously, but let's get your take on when a couple breaks up, do you have to return the gifts? What's what's the policy? Because at the time, the Drake Ed was going to keep all the gifts. But I then as you... Really good question. Um, I would give them back, yeah. I would totally give them back. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that, uh, really that was kind of the... Like that. Yeah, yeah. That was kind of the beauty of the show and just some of the, the minutia that most people get irritated about. They made a whole show about it, which was incredible. Um, I, had, yeah, I, the, I had a real life. I, th I think everybody probably has a real life story that could be a Seinfeld episode. Let's hear it. I had this one thing that happened to me that I was like, this should be on Seinfeld. Um, when I was in college, I went to Hofstra University in Hempstead, Long Island. And I was with this friend of mine who lived in an apartment near. And um, we went into the city, took the train from Hempstead, um, Long Island, into the city to see a show, came back to the Hempstead train station. We're walking from the train station to his apartment and on the way got mugged. I mean, gun between my eyes, oh my while it's taken, terrifying. I thought I was going to die. And then we get back to his car. We were too freaked out to stay in Hempstead. We drive to my mother's house um, on Long Island and we stay there. And then a few days or like a week later, I'm talking to John, I'm like, oh my God, how do you feel? Are you, you know, do you feel okay about living there? He said, you won't believe what happened. I said, what? He said, I got a call from a woman who found our wallets in her husband's top drawer he had died and she's going through his stuff and found our wallets and called him. All the money had been taken out of it. So we are assuming that whoever took our wallets, took the money, took the credit cards and just tossed the wallets. This guy found the wallets, put them in his top drawer, died. Wife calls us. And so John is like, oh, my God, thank you so much. Thank you so much for calling. Is there anything I can do for you? And she said, well, actually, I've got family coming in from out of town for the funeral. He ended up picking up her whole family at the airport. For the that's wild. Isn't that a Seinfeld episode? Yeah, though? I mean, that's just a, yeah, that's a crazy story. I mean, you could sell, you could have sold that to one of the Seinfeld writers. I mean, that's what they want is those real stories that are just crazy. A story that's not really funny, but kind of funny. Like you're, you feel like, is it okay to laugh? Is it yeah. okay? Well, it's like it's like stealing a handicap spot, right? I mean, exactly. You know. <laughs> yeah, exactly. But that. But, I, I mean, that have you had a story happen to you in life where you're like, this is a Seinfeld episode? Yeah, it definitely comes up. Yeah, you think about it. You're like, this could this could be one, you know, like when you're thinking about it. It's definitely true. That's really funny. And, and so so are you originally from New York or you just ended up at Hofstra? Because we know the area pretty well from that area. I'm from Long Island, yeah. Oh, okay, there you go. Perfect. So I, gr I grew up in Amityville and okay. then we moved to West Gilgo Beach, which is five miles east of Jones Beach, that little strip of land. 
I went to Hofstra University. Um, and then after I went to finish with college, uh, went to school in London for a year. I'm a Shakespeare nerd. I'm a classical theater person. Um, so I studied in London for a year and then, um, I moved to LA in 89 with Tony and Tina's wedding. So I did Tony okay. and Tina's wedding for years in New York and then it moved out to LA in 1989. I moved out to LA for four months and I'm still here. <laughs> Wow. Uh, any any uh, Massapequa talk with Jerry when you're on set, uh, bonding about Long Island when you were... Uh, oh, God, I wish I could uh, yeah, yeah. I'm sure I did. You know, in the Baldwins, I, you know, every time right, I run right. into the Baldwin. I know um, I don't run into the Baldwins all the time, but I know Isabel Hoffman, who used to be married to Daniel Baldwin. So, yeah, us Long Island people stick together. It's a small world. So what are you up to uh, these days, Elizabeth? Uh, obviously, I know you said you're teaching, uh, you're teaching others act, the, the art form of acting, but uh, any other projects you want to kind of get out there? I, um, uh, well, the pandemic really was hard. Um, before that, I was teach. I teach um, Shakespeare at the Los Angeles County High School for the Arts, 10th graders, which is as stressful and exhausting as it sounds. Um, putting on shows. Thoughts on... Thoughts on Comedy of Errors, the play Comedy of Errors. Me and Chris yeah. started in Comedy of Errors in our uh, fourth grade production. What? Yeah. No way. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Dromeo of Ephesus and uh, Dromeo of, what was the other Syracuse. place? Syracuse. Syracuse. You were the Dromeos. Yeah, we were the yes. Dromeos, star of the show, wow. stars of the show. Yeah, my, my son, um, my other son, William, the filmmaker, just was a DP on a modern adaptation musical version of the comedy of errors that uh, was done by- Oh, Nicholas. wow. Yeah, yeah. And the uh, Romeo and the, um, uh, oh my God, Antipholus were played by the same actor. So they had the same, the Santa twins being played by the same actor. Huh. Do some really um, nifty shape shifting filmmaking. So the yeah. actors played their own twins. Um, so do, I did that before the pandemic. I did a production of um, a play called The Humans down at South Coast Rep. I mean, San Diego Rep. My God, my brain. San Diego Rep. Um, and since then, you know, just little bits and pieces here and there. But it's been, yeah, it's, the pandemic has been hard. It's been tough. Um, it's been hard for sure, but luckily shows like Seinfeld have been streaming and, and keeping us laughing. And um, especially you, Elizabeth, you will forever be known as the Drake get. And uh, we, we can't thank you enough for, for love, spending some love time. Love the Drake. Love the Drake get. Coming down memory lane with us. Uh, we appreciate it. We thank love, we love your work and uh, keep it up. Thank you. I'm sorry. I'm so, so old and, and <laughs> just <laughs> This yeah, was no, great. It, was, it was really fun. It was an honor, an honor to be in that um, masterpiece of a show. Really, really incredible. Master of my domain. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Elizabeth, thank you, thank so, you much. so much. Have a safe trip to, to thank you the, so Drake, the Drake get the Drake get everybody. Love the Drake get. <laughs>